I am Tiffany Taylor. Um, the, I'm the director of our success and education team at Handshake and by extension, our community, or I should say communities fall under my team's purview. A couple of things that make our community unique is that not unique. You won't have done this. We're in the middle of transition. I say communities because right now they're in two spaces. And I was definitely honest with Elijah. As, I don't know if it's ours is the best, but I think all of us can acknowledge that what has come to make our community great is that we are open to speaking about the mistakes, the things that didn't go well, so that we can all learn from those. And I think right now, why it's a good time to talk about that is because we are in the transition of, or people are in two spaces. Is that working? Maybe it is in some bizarre way or how do we start to shift? And right now we're taking all of that information, looking at the spikes of engagement, who is talking where, is it newer customers in Slack versus our older customers on our homegrown platform? And so that is a very unique space to be in for me, I think, and a lot of learning and nuances are happening in that space. And I think to have that real sense of what is the uniqueness of our community is so core to attracting people in because we all have lots of things to do with our time. And so it's always a, a bit of a battle to say like, why should you spend your time within our community versus some other space? So I'd love to talk a little bit about basically the, my favorite thing, the thing I love geeking out on, which is really like that onboarding path. What is the most typical path that your members take as they, they come from, oh, I've gained some rough awareness to you. How do they enter? Are there application forms? Are there hoops they have to jump through? What is the process to go from, I have some interest to, I'm actually a full member of this community. If you can just walk us through the most typical path, um, especially I know for Tiffany, you have multiple communities, pick your main one for the moment for this. That would be helpful. And if, if you want to go first and just talk about what is the path people follow? Okay. So we have the larger network where everybody and anybody that goes through any of our programs, say training programs, or it's basically it's a community and they're um, head of few emails that you received to several of them I remember I mentioned earlier it's a unique is that we identify students uh, we have programs that are that on so one of the sessions career in tech a lot of students right uh know how to or they want to but they are stuck in you know, regular is why it would I don't know, guess the buzzer. They've been able to click on any of our links or right to even have what's becoming it's the program where have students and a lot that lead the villages. So we have these ambassadors that also you know, also have direct locations and direct contact. In smaller WhatsApp groups or smaller Telegram groups, we need to because you know that but they get invited to join Telegram group if they are interested to get to join Telegram group is by having like very difficult to do um, One year, how can you what one dollar had yesterday? Okay, and a lot had like thousands of questions for a particular yeah. question requesting that we should you know say that having a community discussion, you know, so that you we ask questions. So thousands of people flood in the group at the customer. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. I wonder in those different steps, do you have any intentional barriers to entry? Like any kind of like steps that someone must complete before they can forward to the next step? So you can add a little bit of filtering to identify the most engaged people. So every month or every so we have some sort of reviews that went that we no big eye, not profit. We much more open and compared to having who is now. Mm -hmm. We have um, invited you to join us in giving you in this like a joy. And it's most the Telegram links that we're currently that moving into a of the other having a conversation. Okay, that's here to link for you to be a community member. Mm. Once you put in a specific search, then an onboarding email or not, it's a part of the system. 
that time we started a few times like remove participants from the groups or from uh Communities. That's really helpful to get a sense of one, the, the importance of this standard, the gardening, that the cleanup, to make sure you've really got the, the most engaged people there and sort of remove those who've fallen off, as well as the fact that there is this application process for you to say, like, Telegram is a place where we want to make sure we have the high quality conversations and we make sure that everyone's in there. We've got rid of the spammers and others who may have just sort of come in because they had some low interest. Tiffany, in your world, what's your standard onboarding process? Absolutely. Luckily for us, our audiences are typically higher education partners. And if any of you either have, were, former life, or that is your customer base, communities are actually very much a part of how higher ed functions. When I was there, that was my career for 15 years before joining. I like to say higher ed built that system. They have been in message boards long before we created cousins of tools that do that so well. They've been sharing their publications. They share best practices there. So it would have behooved us to really cry, try, attempt to model that because our communities, our audiences, our, our chatter boxes in those forums. The one that we have that is homegrown they can actually get access to in the dropdown in the platform. So there is no logging in. Once they're already in the platform, they can go to the community. That is the most seamless way. And most of our customers tend to have a handshake up on their desktop. I will say in that dropdown, it does take them out of, right? It doesn't happen in our system. So when you click on community, it's, it, will, it will open in a new window. And we all know as small as that is, that is a barrier. It's now, oh, I'm in a new place. Even though the SSO integration does mean that they don't have to log in, it is a new place and it's separate and apart from what is living and where they're working in the platform each day. The other system, they're typically having to join by getting a, a unique link from any of their CSMs. The obstacle there is that is housed in Slack and many of our partners and higher ed institutions absolutely don't use Slack. And so mm. that means a different downloaded and, and certainly outside of our platform. And again, um, happy to share it another time or if it comes up today, definitely seeing different types of users in each space because some actually think Slack is easier while other folks um, are looking at the, the historical space that our, our homegrown platform has. But that's the barrier for entry in right. those spaces. Right. So your barriers to entry happened because people are custom. So they, they actually had a pretty high barrier of entry to pass to get into the, to begin with. So that's really interesting. And, and I actually want to go directly next into that, though, where do we lose people in your onboarding process? And, and Tiffany, you really made that as simple as possible. You've got single sign on, you, you tried to find all of those barriers and knock them down. And yet. Even just any kind of mild context change throws people off. And it'll obviously be downloading a new app that might be new to you, but quite a big barrier to entry. Given that between the two communities, do you think, which of those do you think is your more successful strategy for you? Is it getting people into the app that they already use if they're Slack people already? Or is it like use the handshake SSO account they already have? Like, what do you think is more successful for you? Funny enough, I think it is Slack, which again, if I was a betting woman, I would have been bankrupt because I would never have thought that, again, to your point, downloading an application that is, again, some of our schools might not even, um, some of our partners, workplaces might not allow you to download that. And so the, the amount of obstacles for um, engaging in the Slack community are high, but because of the ease of my team being able to host when we have a webinar. Hey, join us in Slack for this webinar conversation. Hmm. The ease of add-on events, the ease of even other folks being able to private message each other has more engagement because of just the ease of the Slack platform. So I see more frequent, often, and larger quantity of engagement in Slack. What I will say, the difference, and again, this very much mirrors the audience, what happens in our homegrown community, we see lengthier, more thoughtful complaints, concerns, best mm -hmm. practices. It definitely mirrors what I know they're doing in their other academic spaces and communities. So it is different content. But to the point where we see drop off and engagement there is that sometimes folks will ask a question and it's in the void. 
right? Because maybe folks feel, a high, not maybe, I know folks feel a higher burden for language, clarity. It, again, these are published audience members who yeah. might be faculty. They want, so that time, it might not come with the, the brevity and casualness of a Slack message, mm -hmm. right? Of, a, of an emoji. And so it's a very different, which is why I'd started off at the top. And I'm thinking I, as burdensome as it would be, and I dare I say it into the universe, maybe I keep both. <laughs> <laughs> I am not even going to say that to my team, but this is where we are at, that it is truly different things happening in both spaces and different drop-offs. I totally hear you. I am in that same place, which is I've got a Slack group and a Facebook group. I desperately have tried to kill that Facebook group, and I can't because some people are so committed to the platforms they're on. And I think we all see this as community managers, this real push and pull of, well, do we use the platforms what people are already on all day? Because cause that just reduces so many barriers to entry to get people in versus like, like I'm on this other platform. I don't really control it. It's like the data may not even be mine. It's like, it's hard to report on. But at the other hand, at the end of the day, people are there. And that's just so important. Like sometimes you just got to go where the party's at. You got this same kind of like, like onboarding challenge of just many platforms. There's the WhatsApp. There is the Telegram. And what led you to to those choices of those platforms? Was it, again, the question of where are people already? Telegram was easier because uh, a lot of students had Telegram or could easily download Telegram, right? The choice for the ambassadors because it's more no control and have access to their community instead of students. So here, <laughs> so I did, I did. Last year, and of some sort of engagement for some of our, for example, we had data car, and because data car was a self help based platform to be able to engage in, we had Slack, Slack to work, and but it wasn't necessary what to use, but our community members Slack didn't necessarily work again because we have to pay for each and every single member for every. We have access, so we had to. We have training of uh, science. We have software. We have and we have uh, products. Then we have product management to do stuff. Um, events around them. We have trainings around them. We have this around. Once once we start to ha once uh, let's say okay, so a typical example would be last year we had thirty days of design challenge. The Programmers started to get jealous of the designers because it was like we were focusing more on the, on the designers for 30 days. And a lot of the conversation was on the, on the Telegram channel. So we started to, oh, why can't we have different channels for the different groups so we can also have our own challenges and stuff like that. And that was when the platform Dev.2 came into mind when we started doing a lot of Again, we have to put into factor that we're non-profit and we needed a mm -hmm. career. What can we do? Shout out to them for something that they're easily good to communicate. But I think, or in terms of, uh, it's easier for them to join the Telegram groups that are where having their product to their ambassador. And so how do you anticipate those, like the house, like the home built platform that you're working on, interacting with the WhatsApp and the Telegram groups? Do you feel like maybe those become the easy air bear, like easy access onboarding place and then as people become more engaged you move them into the home platform or how do you anticipate those things interacting i don't think we will. it's called a platform like the, you have to you, know, you might have to in the browser or now is to start to get back right so start with the network of so navigate that and get them to start each ambassador or each is on the platform. So I think that would be a break that barrier. Once we'll that's to have their own events on that platform, hopefully that would get conversation going. Most of the time, I do not want to think about it. Yes. Yeah. Well, but, but like I said, I don't think we have a different We're community managers. We're used to failure and then we just roll forward and keep going. So, so thank you. I, let's turn to some of the questions from our uh, the, uh, the audience here. We've got Lydia, what, do you want to proceed with your first question? Sure. Um, thank you. So I am a community manager for a platform for public servants, a learning platform for public servants. And so part of our onboarding process is making sure that 
the learners are public servants and verifying their profiles or providing a government email address and stuff. And then also verifying their, obviously. And people get really frustrated with the multiple steps involved. And so I was just wondering if you had any advice for, obviously there are some technical solutions that could help reduce that friction, but just in terms of your experience of what, yeah, what tips you might have in that scenario. People would not necessarily want to join the community unless it's up, right. So like, so, so we currently have over what, 20,000 network and circle members, right? It is really, I don't put them in with Scott, like with tech, that's what they right? that the training, because we call it, we call it the scholarship. The, we have questions in the, um, what's your age? Are you a student? They obviously feel, imagine you have something that would obviously give information, sort out the, the poor people that you want and then continue connections from. Awesome. Tiffany, I know you did a reply in the chat. Do you want to just give us a nice summary? Yeah, Lydia, I can only imagine the struggle of having a vetting process. I, I only on a very moderate scale experience that as you all heard are only vetting. And I say only, cause obviously the burden as Elijah put it is becoming a member. You're becoming a, a user of our platform that involves paying for a product, hopefully getting your entire institution on board, yada, yada. But once you're in, and I actually have very little to do with that vetting experience. So does my team once that sales hands off happened, but much in the same way prospects often want to, oh, what are my colleagues saying? What is this institution that I benchmark off of? What help with seeing a community engagement could lure you, could actually help with the sell. But because it is very, um, it's a, it is a closed space. They're having, again, folks are openly complaining about the products, giving feedback, also cheering each other on. It is a private space. And so when we share that with folks, hey, folks are sharing their data here. Uh, we want them to know that's only happening with other partners, with other folks who are within that space, utilizing the platform with them. And that has often assuaged the feelings of, oh, I just want to get in. And our folks often want to see, I've done similar presentations for our customer education community, and folks often want to get in the training and our training is gated. It's very much, you have to be in our platform to gain access to that. And that can often allow folks to feel okay, I know you're trying to be, provide a private space, a safe space, and that's a, an amount of trust and I'm not a part of the community yet. And so that has been um, a helpful way. I've often asked, what is it that you're hoping to get? If they're like, oh, I just want to chat with some folks as about to answer Alfred's question in the chat as well. We provide them with peer resources. I mean, go in the community and say, hey folks, whoever prospect who'd like to talk about the handshake experience, any volunteers? And then outside of that, send along the email and do an e-connection because folks do want to be a part of it and being vetted. I, again, you worded it well in your question. I don't have too much to add in terms of how to assuage that. Lovely. Thank you. I'll say from my world, I run a chapterized community of basically local groups of volunteers who are planning technology training events for other nonprofits. Um, and my world, I've got sort of the two parts. I've got the event attendees, no barrier to entry. If you can create a password and a login to get it onto the events, mission accomplished. But for my chapter host, I've got all kinds of barriers. I torture them because, because I want to have the best, most engaged people. Because if I go through a whole trade process and then they disappear, well, then that was basically a big waste of my time. So it's for my standpoint, actually, I really do want to put some barriers of entry in to make sure that I'm getting people who are gonna stay and be with us a year from time. So for me, my top barriers to entry are basically part two. So they come in, they apply, and step number one is I make them get on a 30 minute phone call with me, live in person. That pushes lots of people away. Uh, but if you're gonna host events, you need to be comfortable in like a more conversational setting. So I think it's to me an appropriate barrier because it helps me actually filter for the right kind of people. So I think barriers to entry are super important as long as they're helping you find the right people and, and find the right fits and matches. And after that phone call, I torture them even more because now what I say is before we'll even let you touch the platform, I want you to come to me with three event outlines, time, date, topic, potentially even your location. And so that's your homework. Go do that homework. I'll check in with you a couple of times, but if they don't come back to me at that point, then I'll poke them three times. But if that's the end of it, 
then I'm just going to let them drift away. Because if, again, if they don't have the ability to get to that core part of starting to think through events, then they're, they're not going to succeed in the role anyway. So to me, those barriers are super helpful. And so I say, don't worry about barriers to entry and, and application forms as long as they're helping you filter to the right. We've got a question coming in here from Alfred. Alfred, do you want to jump on mic quickly? Yes, Elijah. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, you're great. Okay, nice to be here. And so just in case I do get stuck in the midst of uh, me introducing myself, the internet connection here is really bad. So please don't get mad at me. So my name is Alfred Collins and I'm currently working with the Bob Africa. It's an air tech startup based in Nigeria as a community manager. I also work with the World Economic Forum, setting up uh, what is known as a global shapers community. I don't know if anyone has heard of that. I work with the World Economic Forum, setting up global shapers communities in my local, what's it called here? Yeah, over here in Nigeria. So it's been an amazing experience for me, just building communities for young people. In my first full-time room, which I just secured recently, I've been having to study the world demographic of young people involved with this tech startup. And I noticed that a lot of them are actually building their house. It's the first time I'll be building uh, an exclusive community on Discord. I'll typically be using um, Telegram or WhatsApp. But looking at demograph, um, the demograph I'm dealing with, I'm trying to increase user engagement. I want to increase the amount of conversations going on among community members. I'm trying to use Discord. I don't know if anyone has used Discord. I know a lot of persons have been talking about Slack, Telegram, same thing with Anifa. Anifa, it's actually very, very nice to meet you. Great work you're doing over at Aggressive. I'm also from Nigeria. <laughs> So um, I don't know if anyone has experience with um, Discord, how has it been, or any doubts about using this? And I just want to actually open up responses to this question to, to the other attendees as well, to see if we have anyone else here with any experience or thoughts around Discord. And again, you can either throw that in the chat, and I'm happy to read the response out for you, or you can jump on camera and share your experience. But first of all, let's start off with our two expert panelists. Any opinions or thoughts around Discord? I love the idea of it. My, my partner is a gamer, so I probably know more about many of those things than I should. And I think to, to some of the conversation that we've been alluding to, it's, I think Elijah said, you need to go to where the party is at. And I hope this is even why I explored shifting away from our home grown to Slack. It's, and I hope we never remain stagnant. Our home grown one could be more efficient, prettier, check, it would check every box, but if no one's there, then it's, it's not a community. What are we doing? And so I do think if you have to change where that space is every three years, five years, because other people are migrating, this would be the time where I would like to say my space and then run off the screen. Like, <laughs> I just stated myself, we, we evolve, technology evolves, the way we communicate evolves. And so I, I'm all for it. I would love to know where I, again, our partners would ever be there. They tend to be older, more traditional, and I think it's a great way to go. I've got a comment coming in here from Curry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So can it's a bit of this quote for but in part of it's eater or amazing it's a lot of millennials as well as that are in that it's or the gaming space. So I guess it's at the end of the day it's still and it depends on to be to fit uh, your community or to fit the program. Um, and they have their reasons for members are set on similar or that, like uh, how best to use it, you know, frustrate you. It's it. Awesome. We've also got a great comment coming in here from Courtney. Do you want to come on mic or I can read it off? But here, so I've uh, got a great comment coming in from Courtney in the chat. He said, I found the styling of Discord to be a bit frustrating. There's just some stylistic things like names, especially with colors and fonts that take brain power to skim. So it can have, so it's got some of this cognitive overload. But otherwise, just if you take away how it looks and reads, well, Courtney likes the platform. So, so thank you for that. That's, uh, that's helpful. Are there other questions coming in from the rest of the participants here? Then, yeah, let me talk a little bit about the next question then, which is, I think let's talk about retention. So we've talked at this point about how do we get people in? And we've talked a little bit about where do we see people drop off? And so what are those barriers to entry, whether that's jumping from platform, whether it's just like time and being stagnant. But when you think about what keeps people in your community, like what's the big draw? What keeps people there over the long term. Tiffany, do you want to start with that? 
Yeah, I, w- I was, I think it was a good response to the question you asked before about the value add. What keeps us is our ability to, we're a tech platform. And I don't know if you all deal with this in your various spaces. I think we all have this very doom and gloom, robots will take over something. And so if you transpose that into the customers I serve, there, there are times where we push out a feature that, wow, someone that just replaced someone's whole job. That can be really scary for folks. But where we have found the most benefit is that we remind them no one, not even us with all the data we sit on, knows students better than they do. No one. And reminding them that and, and how to do the job in their office every day. We are not. What they gain in those spaces is sharing of peer best practices. And so they get elevated. They're like, oh, here's what we did around marketing to nursing majors. Here's what we did to get more students of color apply for that, right? They know that. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be us. In fact, we pride ourselves on putting them at the forefront of our, about half of our webinars are customer led because it's putting them and their work in the forefront. And that's where we see the most conversation, the most engagement, the most where there's, where where it's stickiest in the community is when they're sharing. And even when it's sharing varied perspectives, right? Someone's like, oh, I think sending messages at this time is best. And someone's like, oh, we found this, we found this. And that it's not us saying, we actually scraped all your targeted emails and all of you are wrong. It's not that it's them sharing their perspectives of their students in their region, unique to them. Um, and that happens in the community. I love that response because it, to me, really reminds me of the difference of why we are community managers in this room rather than social media managers and and the difference between those roles, because sometimes they can get conflated for some people, but to you, you talk about what is the value of the community. Ultimately, it's the peer relationships. It's the, it's the, the community, the in between people, part of it. And and I think that's what keeps people there. It's going to be the people, not the relationship with you or your company or your organization. And for you, what do you think is the thing that makes your community sticky? Like what keeps them? You may have frozen on us, but if you can't hear me, you can just, you can turn off your camera to give yourself a little bit more bandwidth and jump in if you're able to respond right now. Otherwise we'll circle back. Yes. All right. So yeah, Hindi, if you can hear me, it sounds like you've frozen, in which case you can actually refresh the browser window and rejoin. And that will often help get you back if something has gone a little bit awry. But I actually want to circle back from the comments to something that came in from Ja, who talks about just some of the concerns around running a community around youth. And I'm wondering if others here have had any other experience around working within youth-led communities and some of the concerns they've got there. To me, some of the onboarding challenges may simply be parental permission, things like that. And I think also the retention challenges I found working with youth or university students is their lives are in such flux and change that that six months for someone who's young is like being in a community for four years for one of my older volunteers. So I feel like retention within those communities is especially tricky in my experience. Have others had similar kinds of experience just seeing like different age demographics being quite different within the uh, the retention cycles? I'm just gonna throw that out to everyone here. So if you want to jump on mic and and chat with us about that idea is percolating in your mind. And of course you can always throw, throw things into the chat. Tiffany, I want to ask you another question while we wait for Hanifa to hopefully be able to rejoin us, which is like, what's one thing that you're bringing on new this year? What's the, obviously you're in a super big time of transition, but then maybe what's the one new thing you're bringing in this year that you're most excited about? Yeah, we're trying to do a full fort learning course in Slack. So again, trying to take a page from our partners and their way of working. Again, anyone who maybe knows a little about higher ed or even higher ed degrees, those are typically given in cohorts and they're taught in cohorts. You move through working on your dissertation, their cohort. And so we decided to take a page from that. We've been collecting our data on new staff member accounts created, and we are pulling them together asking, hey, do you want to be a part of a learning cohort for your newly, your newly joined handshakers. And so essentially in groups of 12, creating a 
cohort in Slack. It's their own channel mm -hmm. and have them drive some of what is happening there. Oh, what did you learn this week? Or how are you preparing for back to school? It's a very busy season. And then have them go into the community and share those, share the resources. And so we're seeing if it's being generated by them, if we can create some very formalized, again, peer best practices learning, but being moved by them instead of by us. If they're saying, hey, it's this time of the year, actually, we really need to double down on data reporting. Let's ask this into the ethers because we've seen when they ask questions versus us, it gets more action, more traction. And so that's what we're trying. I, I don't want to over-engineer it, but we know we're trying to have it live on its own without us mm -hmm. having to do it. So we're thinking that cohort model will be helpful. Interesting. Yeah, no, that would be fun. And we're going to have to bring you back to see what you learned about that experience and, and how much independence it, it actually was able to self-generate. I want to ask you the, the flip side of that question, the hard question, which is, what is one thing you think you're going to stop doing this year? Because you're like, oh, that's, it's actually not working for me anymore. Yeah, I think it's that I have to deprecate one of them, folks. <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I have to deprecate one of these communities. And, but I can't do that before figuring out how to get, I was very honest about what I shared with you, the conversations, the very thoughtful, breathy things that are happening in that space. I need them. We, we value them. They're, some of them get spicy. I want to put like a little jalapeno emoji on them. They're good. And I don't want our customers to think that we're shutting that down. So I'll probably end up doing a focus group over the summer of some of our spicier people um, and pull them together and say, hey, there's a deadline for me to sunset this. Can I charge you to start restart back some of the conversations that you started there? My VP is going to kill me because some of those threads were hot. We had to, mm -hmm. we're actually very happy when they went silent, but I think it's how I'll be able to retain the trust while moving them over into a space that might be a little bit secular, a little bit younger for them, but I need to deprecate that. All right. You're going to do that and you're going to poke some hornet's nests. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. I've also got a, another comment coming in here from Courtney who's just talking about youth and, and people within their own events and communities and say, we do events where we've got drinking. So basically has got a, a cap around age 21. And I'll say within my own community, we've got a cap around basically because we're working with staff members of nonprofits, an age cap of 18. And honestly, it's only there because my organization's lawyers just said, it'll just save us a whole bunch of grief if we just say, you gotta be, you gotta be 18. And I'd say like the content isn't a concern, but just because we're out there with volunteers who are loosely vetted, we just felt like that was going to save us all kinds of potential grief down the road with minimal downside because it wasn't a youth focused community already. I've got a question coming in from Alfred, if you want to jump on Mike. Yeah. Thank you, Elijah. So I'm just curious. I'm going to ask, I'm still an, a very much early stage professional in this um, sector, the community sector. And that's in fact how I found out about CNX, researching videos on YouTube. I stumbled into the Slack channel and decided to register for this event. So I'm wondering to myself, I'm just, I just got my first full-time role. I have to convince my boss. I'm the first person he's getting for anything community management. I'm actually building everything from scratch for this tech-based startup, having to convince them that you guys actually do need a community manager. I think they were very, very impressed with my interview, but now I have to do the work. So for <laughs> anyone who was, <laughs> so for anyone who was being there where you had to put your best foot forward and try to convince your boss or something, what is the biggest advice you have for me now? I'm very young. I just completed an accelerator with the Watson Institute um, based in Boulder, Colorado. That was like my first experience with community design, but now I have to do the work. There's, there's, there are a lot of metrics that I have to convince the business that, oh, this is the input. So this is the change and the impact the communities I am building for you is, is, is creating for your business. I hope I'm not stumbling around my question. I'm just thinking if anyone does have any advice, please share with me. Thank you. So I just want to jump in. Love to have your contributions. I can all start with say first, which is, I think what you said, doing the work is so important with community management. And I would say even more, rather than think of coming up with the perfect, most beautiful thing, think about things that are repeatable. So once you find a couple interactions within your community that work, that people repeat to, that respond to, design it and find the core of it and then do it again. Because it's through the, the doing it again, the repeating, 
that you get better at, that you get to start tweaking and improving the work. From the tech world, they would call that iteration. And I think, to me, a repeatable good thing is better than a fabulous thing that only happens once. Because, you know, we know that from our communications, most of the time, our community is ignoring us. They're, they're busy that week. There's distractions in the background. So don't be afraid of a little bit of repetition because for most people, it'll be new the third time. So that would be one of my recommendations is really think about repeatable things in the work you do. Do others have a sort of nuggets that they've found that really worked as they have started into the community management world? I think just as you're tracking, if you're doing tracking for engagement or certain topics, just be mindful of, I know you said you need to be able to show a lot of data. It won't always look great. The numbers might not always be trending up, but what I hope your employer will see is that your ability to speak to the why. So I know I can tell you when or when in the calendar year our engagement is limited to nil and just being able to speak to that. And if you don't know why, acknowledge that you're exploring it again, but always speak to the why. Maybe this topic, maybe it was outplayed, maybe it got, it got too spicy, maybe it was already an overused topic, maybe the conversation was happening elsewhere. Again, reasons added for nine ten, but being able to explain the why will be helpful. So another resource I would strongly recommend, especially if you're in the early stages, is that the CMX has like what they call the Community Strand Strategy Canvas, basically a one-pager. And what it really does is it just asks a lot of those standardized questions around exactly what Tiffany was talking about which is the why, and also then how do we measure it? And make sure you don't skip any of the questions because I always fill this out, honestly, every two years, I come back to that campus because there's always things I've forgotten about. Oh, I'm doing this part and this part, but I forgot about the other part of my community where, where I had to come back and do like some regular rituals. So I think having something that you can just look at, come back to and hold yourself loosely accountable to as well is also super helpful. We're also getting some great feedback here from Hanifa and Ja, can you want to jump on mic and, and expand on that? That'd be super helpful. And if Hanifa can't, fair enough, then I will uh, just read it out for you. So Hanifa says it's super important to know what the first few months of, of your starting it is a learning part, process. You want basically to make sure people want, like your boss knows you're not going to get results in the first couple of months. Like this is the learning process. This is where we're going to figure out like, what works. So we're going to try a lot of things. We're going to throw that spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And hopefully, Hanifa, I, I captured, I think, what you were trying to say there. And, uh, and Ja says, I would say design for the margins. Think about your participants who aren't the majority to embed accommodations that will improve the experience in for all. Well, that's super interesting, actually, because I often like to go deeper into my niches. But yeah, Ja's talking about the value of thinking about those who who are at the margins and making sure that when you accommodate them, we accommodate everyone. Like we, we increase accessibility. So I love that. The, in the ed and nonprofit world, it's often referred to as universal design for learning. That's a fabulous concept. Jai, if you've got a link that you want to share around that idea in the chat, that'd be super appreciated. Thank you. And honestly, at this point, we're better wrap. Anyone have one last final insight they want to share? Tiffany, what's your top level nugget you want to send people home with? Welcome the spicy. I think that's the, that's, re, that's the theme that no community should be. In fact, I would worry if it was always a bed of roses. I, I have really appreciated the experience of sitting with my team and saying, do we leave that comment? Do we allow folks to continue to engage? When do we choose to engage in it? Also, is it giving us something good to reflect on? Is there a flaw in the product? Can we translate that spicy take to our next product meeting with our engineers? So embrace the spicy. It's my takeaway. Love it. Super grateful to you and Hanifa, who isn't able to come back on, but has been here with us in the chat as well. 